No historian or journalist can ignore the importance of this incident we're about to witness. At that time, it shocked the world and the international community. It cleared some ambiguities and corrected false assumptions of the old school mentality that the European politicians held on to with every fiber of their being. The triple invasion of Egypt by British, French and Israeli forces, all having their own reasons, raised some important eyebrows in the political community and was an important test for the newly established United Nations to see if it can resolve this conflict through peaceful means. As for the other nations of the world, this incident showed them that they have new bosses around the block to bow down to and also gave a platform for nations who sought freedom and self-determination to make their voice heard. Welcome to the Suez Crisis of 1956. Here's a summary of what we'll discuss in this documentary. The construction of the Suez Canal, located in the Egyptian Sinai Desert, took 10 years and the Egyptian government, in addition to French and British investors, contributed to financing its construction. It was opened in 1869 and enjoyed great fame since the beginning of its activity, as it reduced the crossing distance for ships coming from Europe to Asia or vice versa to a very large extent. Instead of crossing through the Cape of Good Hope, which is thousands of kilometers away from the old continent, it also strengthened trade between European countries and their colonies located in the Middle East, Asia and Australia. As it fell into several financial crises and accumulated huge amounts of debts, the Egyptian government became unable to manage the canal effectively and sold all the shares it owned in the Suez Canal Company, which amounted to 44% to the British government at the price of £4 million sterling while French investors continued to own 56% of the remaining shares. But, after the invasion of Egypt in 1882 and making it a British protectorate, Britain took complete control of the country in general, and the Suez Canal in particular, and managed all the financial, operational, and security affairs of the canal. This gave Britain enormous benefits that it had never imagined before, plus facilitating the passage of its commercial and military ships in the First and Second World Wars while extending its financial and global influence. The canal proved to be an essential element for global navigation as it reduced the distance traveled between the Mediterranean Sea and the Asian ports, which in turn leads to reducing the cost of transportation of goods and passengers. At the end of the 19th century, countries around the world rushed to win the favor of the London government so that their various ships could cross the canal without any issues or complications. Thirty-four years before the invasion occurred, Egypt gained its independence from Britain in 1922 as the latter supported the newly established monarchy led by King Fuad I, who in turn protected vital British interests on Egyptian lands. Perhaps the most important ones are Britain's continued control of the Suez Canal plus maintaining the presence of its forces on Egyptian soil. Perhaps few of those who belonged to the ruling elite supported these policies adopted by the Egyptian king, but most of the Egyptian people and many of the political, religious and military elites strongly opposed them. They believed that the regime was completely subjected to the will of Great Britain and could not stand up in the face of the colonial government of London. After the end of World War II, the opposing opinions began to emerge intensively and publicly. This led the regime to horribly suppress anyone who expressed opposition to the king's policy. At the same time, an informal military clique of senior officers within the Egyptian royal army, called the Free Officers, began preparing for a coup against the royal regime with Soviet and American support. And indeed, 
The coup led by Muhammad Najib and Jamal Abdel Nasser on July 23, 1952, succeeded in overthrowing the British-supported monarchy and exiled King Farouk to Italy. After that, in a power struggle, Jamal Abdel Nasser ousted his colleague in the Free Officers' clique, Muhammad Najib, from power, thus becoming the sole leader of Egypt. He started implementing several hostile policies towards the countries that subsequently invaded Egypt, namely Israel, France, and Britain. Perhaps the most prominent of these policies are Before Jamal Abdel Nasser came to power in 1952, a war broke out between the Arab countries, including Egypt and Israel, between 1947 and 1949, due to Arabs' opposition to the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, with the latter committing massacres in an industrial level against the Palestinians and forcibly deporting a large number of them. After the Arabs' loss of the war, the Egyptian government, led by King Farouk, decided to implement a naval blockade on Israeli ships in the Suez Canal in addition to the Strait of Tehran. This greatly angered Israel as it filed a complaint to the United Nations to force the royal regime to abandon the blockade, but it did not do so. After the arrival of Jamal Abdel Nasser in 1952, Israel hoped that the issue would be reconsidered and the new Egyptian regime would stop the blockade. But Jamal Abdel Nasser continued the same previous policy. Then, Israel realized that the military might was the only solution to force Egypt to ditching its naval siege of Israeli ships. As a result, the Israeli army command began preparing military plans to invade Egyptian territory. People who know nothing about this crisis can say that the intervention of Israel and Britain in Egypt is understandable, given the shared history between the three countries. But what is up with France's involvement in Egypt? France has never colonized Egypt or has ever taken its lands. The reason for the French invasion of Egypt in 1956, along with Israel and Britain, was to stop the support of Jamal Abdel Nasser's regime for the armed rebellion against the French colonial rule in Algeria. He supported financially, politically and militarily an armed organization called Le Front de Libération Nationale, in English is called National Liberation Front, who led the rebellion. The goal of the armed group was the independence of Algeria from France. Egyptian leader Jamal Abdel Nasser had an ambition to lead the Arab world and get rid of foreign imperialism that was still present and pounding its chest on Arab territories. So he saw supporting the Algerian cause as a first step to achieve those ambitions. You know the proverb that says, strike the shepherd and the rest of the sheep will scatter? Well, since the political leadership of the armed group was present in the Egyptian capital Cairo, France saw that the greatest danger did not come from the military wing of the organization, which was responsible for hundreds of military operations in Algeria including targeted assassinations and bombings, but rather came from the political leadership, which in turn gave orders to the military wing. Since it was located in Egypt, French politicians decided to invade it and overthrow the Nasserist regime in order to stop the armed rebellion definitely. After World War II, Britain continued to control the Suez Canal through British investors owning the majority of the Suez Canal Company shares, despite the withdrawal of its forces from Egypt in 1954. In response to the demands of the Egyptian people and the new military elite, Jamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal Company on July 26, 1956, four days after the fourth anniversary of the overthrow of the monarchy. He delivered a speech ordering the Egyptian armed forces to seize the canal to ensure control over it if any of its workers refused to comply with the nationalization law. 
He justified his action by stating that Egypt had the right to capture the canal because it was built by Egyptian hands under harsh working conditions similar to slavery. The British government was surprised by this decision and felt it as a painful blow to its vital interests and prestige in the Middle East region. The day after the incident, the British Parliament held an emergency session to discuss what happened in an atmosphere characterized by anger amongst members of Parliament, many of whom supported a direct military intervention to oust Abdel Nasser from power. To make it clear to the viewers, the three invading countries shared one goal, which is the overthrow of the Nasserist regime and replace it with another friendly one. But on the other hand, each country had a strategic goal intended specifically for its vital interests. Israel's goal was to guarantee freedom of navigation for its civilian and military ships in the strength of Tehran and the Suez Canal. France's goal was to eliminate the political wing of the Armed National Liberation Front party that opposed French rule in Algeria, and Britain's goal was to regain control of the Suez Canal. In early August 1956, British Prime Minister Anthony Eden ordered his Chief of Staff of the British forces to begin preparing for a military plan to invade Egypt, and Eden suggested using the 16th Parachute Battalion, which was stationed in Cyprus, which was under British rule at that time. The Chief of Staff did not agree with the plan, and noted Eden that the battalion was busy fighting the rebels against the British rule of the island. Plus a naval landing of the marines on the city of Port Said was the best plan to ensure control of the Suez Canal's northern entrance. In July 1956, Moshe Dayan indicated to Ben-Gurion that Israel should attack Egypt at the first opportunity, but Ben-Gurion did not want to attack it alone knowing the extent of the heavy Soviet military support for Egypt. Therefore, he was looking for an ally, possibly either France or Britain. On August 7, 1956, French Defense Minister asked Ben-Gurion about the possibility of Israel accepting France's offer to join its attack on Egypt, which the Israeli Prime Minister accepted. So, at the beginning of September 1956, the French and Israeli governments began to prepare plans together to invade the lands of the pharaohs. The problem that faced both sides was their ignorance of the British government's point of view on this matter. Before the nationalization incident, Britain did not support Israel's attack on Egypt to guarantee its freedom of navigation, and as a result, France did not count on the British to join in with them and Israel. But the governments of Paris and Tel Aviv had to know the answer from the British themselves. On October 5, 1956, French General Maurice Chal went on a visit to London and met with British Prime Minister Eden and told him of the preparations being made by France and Israel to remove the Nasserist regime from the throne. Britain reluctantly agreed to the two countries' participation in the military operation due to Israel's participation as British politicians feared the Arab world's reaction to their alliance with the Israelis, which might lead to a deterioration in British relations with their Hashemite allies in Iraq and Jordan. The three parties met for the last time before the invasion secretly in the French city of Sèvres between October 22nd and 24th, 1956, to discuss the final war plan they agreed that Israel would begin a ground invasion of the Sinai Peninsula on October 29, 1956, with the aim of reaching the Suez Canal area the next day. Then, Britain and France would issue an ultimatum to both the Egyptian and Israeli forces to withdraw 30 kilometers away from the canal. If Egypt rejected the ultimatum, which was likely, Britain and France would intervene militarily to seize the canal under the pretext of separating the warring forces. Pursuant to the Sevres Protocol, 
the IDF under the codename Operation Qadish invaded the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip on October 29, 1956 by land and air at 3 p.m. Fearing the Jordanian Hashemite forces would intervene to support Egypt, Israel placed military forces and border police on its borders with Jordan to confront them in case of a Jordanian attack. A curfew was imposed on the border villages adjacent to the Jordanian state, most of whose residents are Israeli Arabs. Some residents of the border village of Kafar Qasim were not aware of the Israeli government's decision, and many of them did not abide by it. So, the Israeli police committed a massacre against the village residents, killing anyone who violated the curfew, even if they were not aware of it. Accounts indicate that 48 people were killed by the police, but the Israeli government arrested the police members involved in a massacre, tried them and sentenced them from 7 to 17 years in prison. After 51 years, Israeli President Shimon Peres apologized for that massacre. Israel's goal in the Sinai Peninsula was to control the Mitla Pass, which is the main road leading to the Suez Canal, and the coastal city of Sharm el-Sheikh, located south of Sinai, to stop the Egyptian blockade on Israeli ships in the Strait of Tehran, while its goal in the Gaza Strip was to control the strategic Rafah crossing to secure the roads leading to the main cities of northern Sinai, such as cities of Arish and Qantara, in addition to destroying the Palestinian Fida'iyin brigades who rejected the existence of the State of Israel. From October 29th to November 3rd, Israeli military operations focused on the Mitla Pass in the Sinai Peninsula and the Rafah crossing in the Gaza Strip. The first mission was assigned to Colonel Ariel Sharon, who landed paratrooper forces 400 kilometers from the pass and fought fierce battles against Egyptians. In the end, he succeeded in capturing it. The second task was assigned to Colonels Benjamin Ribli and Haim Barliv, who led their battalions with the support of French artillery units to victory over the forces of Jamal Abdel Nasser and the Palestinian Fida'in. It is worth noting that Egypt sent a destroyer belonging to the Egyptian navy to the city of Haifa, north of Israel, called Ibrahim I, to bomb oil facilities located on its coast. The French destroyer Kersant counterattacked, but without causing any damage. But with the intervention of Israeli warships, orders were issued to the destroyer Ibrahim I to retreat. Israeli destroyers pursued the Ibrahim I with Israeli air support, severely damaging the Egyptian ship. As a result, the latter surrendered to the Israeli forces. After its success in controlling the Mitla and Rafah crossings, the turn came on Israeli forces to take control of the coastal city of Sharm el-Sheikh, located in southern Sinai. The Israelis faced two problems that stood in the way of their goal, the nature of Sharm el-Sheikh's terrain and the heavy presence of Egyptian forces there, as Sharm el-Sheikh was considered one of the most fortified Egyptian cities during the era of Jamal Abdel Nasser. On October 30th, Israel succeeded in controlling the city of Ras al-Naqab, which leads to Sharm el-Sheikh. Then, IDF Chief of Staff Moshe Dayan ordered the commander of the infantry battalion, Avraham Yofi, to not enter Sharm el-Sheikh until his forces were reinforced with air and naval support. So, on November 3rd, the Israeli naval and air forces together bombed the fortified areas in the city. A day later, the Yofi brigades entered the city, and after very fierce fighting, they succeeded in controlling it. And finally, the Egyptian army commander in Sharm el-Sheikh surrendered. As agreed in the Seville Protocol, one day after the Israeli invasion of Egypt, Britain and France issued an ultimatum to Israel and Egypt stating the immediate cessation of military activities and threatening military intervention if the ultimatum was not heeded. As it was expected, these demands were not met. So, Britain and France intervened militarily by launching Operation Musketeer on November 1st, 1956, 
The operation included aerial bombardment of vital centers for the Egyptian forces, in addition to providing military, intelligence and logistical support to the Israeli forces present in Israel, the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula. Egypt was able to destroy a significant number of French and British warships heading towards the Suez Canal. As a result, it was closed to commercial ships until March 1957. However, British airstrikes exhausted Egypt's defensive capabilities as it was unable to confront any air bombardment. On November 5th, the British and French forces landed units of their paratroopers on the city of Port Said, specifically at the Jamil base of the Egyptian Air Forces, which had been destroyed by previous British raids. The aim of the landing was to control the city of Port Said, which is the northern gateway to the Suez Canal. Heavy fighting took place between the invaders and the Egyptian forces, and Jamal Abdel Nasser armed the civilians and issued instructions to them to confront any occupying force in the land of the pharaohs. The aim of Jamal Abdel Nasser from the involvement of civilians in a battle was to gain the sympathy of international public opinion when it witnessed the fall of significant number of civilian casualties defending their homeland from the invaders and to weaken the British and French people's morale. The tripartite invasion became the subject of world talk and an issue of international public opinion as the United Nations made significant efforts to stop the fighting and return to the status quo, and here the diplomatic side comes into play. Immediately after the Israeli invasion of Egypt on October 30th, an emergency meeting of the Security Council was held on an American request and came out with resolution number 119 stipulating a complete cessation of military activities in the Sinai Peninsula. The resolution was not adopted due to the British and French veto. The Soviet government never accepted the tripartite invasion and considered it an outright aggression and a blatant violation of Egypt's sovereignty. Given the strong relationship between the Cairo and Moscow governments and their powerful cooperation in the diplomatic and military fields, as the Soviets were one of the biggest arms selling countries to Egypt during the era of Abdel Nasser. Nikolai Bolganin, head of the Soviet government at that time, threatened to bomb Tel Aviv, Paris and London with ICBMs if the invasion continued. Eisenhower was very concerned about the possibility of the Soviet intervention in Egypt, but the Soviet pressure to end the invasion did not reach the level the American pressure did, and this is according to the testimony of the Egyptian president himself, Jamal Abdel Nasser. The United States reaction surprised the entire world, especially the governments of the three invading countries with whom had a strong relationship as it strongly condemned their actions and requested an emergency meeting in the Security Council to contain the situation. But the question is, what made America condemn the actions? There are three reasons for this. The first reason is the United States attempt to remove the old powers which were Britain and France from the global leadership's throne and to weaken their global influence. The second reason comes as a result of the first one, which is the US attempt to fill the gap left by the old powers when they leave their colonies, protectorates or spheres of influence. In other words, more precisely, America tried to expel British influence from Egypt and French rule from Algeria hoping to be replaced with American influence in both countries. The third reason was the desire of the American president at that time, Dwight Eisenhower, to weaken the communist influence led by the Soviets in the Arab world and to try to win over Egypt, which was considered at that time to be the leader of the Arabs on the side of the capitalist bloc. This policy was known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. As we said a moment ago, America played the largest and the most important role in imposing a ceasefire and ending the invasion, but this does not mean that the pressure from the Soviets and the United Nations was in vain. 
After Britain and France vetoed the Security Council resolution, the United States did two things towards Britain, the leader of the tripartite invasion. First, it threatened to sell the sterling bonds that America had owned since the days of World War II, if it did not agree to end the invasion. Of course, this is bad news for Britain, because if America sells those bonds, the interest rate in the British money market would rise and the pound sterling's value would fall, leading to an increase in the prices of imported goods into Britain. Second, to compensate for the Bank of England's losses between October 30th and November 2nd, in addition to the decrease of its oil supplies after the closure of the Suez Canal, Britain called on the IMF to help it with substantial loans to pull it out of the mud. But America prevented the fund from giving it any assistance. As a result, the fund could not help it with even a single penny. After these American threats, support for the invasion declined among the political elite in Britain. Then, British Prime Minister Anthony Eden realized that the United Kingdom's global influence has declined and Britain is no longer the empire that countries feared at the mere sound of its name. On November 6, 1956, Eden was forced to announce the cessation of all military activities in Egypt without informing his French and Israeli allies beforehand. The British and French withdrawal began on November 8th and was completed on December 22nd, 1956. The Israeli withdrawal from Gaza Strip and Sinai Peninsula was completed until March 1957, but before that, Israel utterly refused the entry of UN peacekeeping forces into the areas it controlled in the two regions. The Suez Crisis witnessed a military victory for the Triple Alliance, but the latter failed to achieve a political and diplomatic victory, as Egypt succeeded in maintaining its control over the Suez Canal and continuing its armed support for the FLN party, but there are several other results, the most important of which we will review. Both France and Britain realized that their global influence was no longer what it was before World War II, especially after the economic pressure exerted by the United States. The traditional powers recognized that America was the new maestro on the world stage and that they had become subservient to what the Americans decide on that stage. The Suez Crisis severely destroyed Eden's reputation on the British political scene, as he was no longer able to confront his political opponents, as they accused him of deception regarding the issue of the Sèvres Protocol, in addition to Winston Churchill's criticism of him for not continuing the military operation. As his health and psychological condition deteriorated, Anthony Eden was forced to announce his resignation on March 9, 1957. The decision to announce the ceasefire by Britain was a painful blow to France, as it felt betrayed by London and Washington, with whom it had a special relationship. French politicians, led by Charles de Gaulle, who later became President of France in 1958, agreed to not rely completely on France's allies, placing the French trust only on its individual capabilities to maintain its national interests in the world. This idea took a fundamental position in the thought of Gaullism, which was named after Charles de Gaulle himself. The Algerian armed movement against the French rule in the 1950s was the most prominent liberation movement that Africa witnessed in that decade, and Cairo was the center of its decision making, as we explained at the beginning of the video. This movement resulted in a fierce war that began in November 1954 and lasted until July 1962, during which violence reached its highest levels. France was considered the largest colonial power in Africa 
at that period, and with the successive attacks of the Algerian FNN fighters, France was forced at first to abandon Tunisian and Moroccan protectorates and had to declare their independence from Paris before the tripartite invasion in order to focus efficiently on the Algerian war. But after it failed to destroy the main supporter of the FLN, which is Egypt, the voice of the African liberation movement started to rise calling for independence from France. As a result, France was once again forced to abandon most of its African colonies by 1958 and 1960, and finally the FLN succeeded in winning independence on July 5th, 1962. Egypt strategically failed to maintain the blockade of Israeli ships in the Strait of Tehran, and Israel was able to secure the navigation of its commercial ships and warships after this invasion. Prior to this military operation, Egypt has always been a deterrent force and a scary boogeyman for the Israelis due to the huge population difference between Egypt and Israel in addition to the significant Soviet military support for Jamal Abdel Nasser. In this invasion, Israel was able to inflict significant damage on the Egyptian forces. Also, it broke the barrier of fear from Egypt among the Israeli people, and the IDF gained huge trust of its government and people. This confidence helped win wars that Israel later fought, such as the wars of 1967 and 1973. During and after the end of the Suez Crisis, Abdel Nasser's regime resorted to a systematic persecution of Egyptian Jews inside Egyptian territory. It incited the Egyptian people to harm them. Also, it imposed harsh economic and judiciary measures towards them and threatened them with deportation. All of this came as a reaction to the Israeli invasion. The goal of the persecution was to displace the Jewish community from Egyptian lands by making Egypt an inhabitable land for Jews. As a result, Egyptian Jews began to leave the land of the pharaohs from December 1956. It is estimated more than 25,000 Egyptian Jews left Egypt, most of them headed towards Israel, the United States and France, and many of them were forced to sign declarations indicating that they left Egypt voluntarily and not by force. The biggest mistake that Britain and France committed was to continue thinking that they were still the main powers dominating the world and that they could still do whatever they wanted on the international scene. It is not possible to know whether the British and French politicians realized the extent of their decline or they just reacted out of recklessness and arrogance, but with exceeding the limits of their capabilities, they dragged themselves to a harsh withdrawal and a shameful political defeat. The governments of London, Paris and Tel Aviv were surprised by the American position as they were not waiting for that particular reaction of Washington, which had a special relationship with them. But national interests are like a lone wolf who only cares about himself and does not enter a wolf pack except for a personal gain.